Okay, so up next we do have James Hughes, who's a um, James Hughes. Who is the director of the Institute for Emerging Technologies? Sorry, there's another E in there somewhere. Ethics. Oh, uh, ethics and emerging. I've oh, got ethics. Well, wow. okay. So. <laughs> typical. <laughs> right. um, yeah. So James is here, and he's also going to be speaking at this, uh, the Humanity Plus conference um, later on a different topic. So um, yeah, pleased to have James to come and speak to us tonight. Thank you. So the obligatory part about publishing excuse me, is that uh, I published my first and only book so far um, eight years ago and had intended to publish another, uh, at least one more since then. Um, but I decided that the next topic uh, that I would address after Citizen Cyborg, which was about politics and social science, which was my background, was going to be neuroscience. And um, I felt, in it, after I started to engage in that research, like someone who had been swept down the river in a massive flood. And uh, recently I felt like someone who's been smashed against the rocks. So I think I finally stopped uh, in my investigation. The flood continues. Uh, but my investigation has, has pretty much stopped on the topic of moral enhancement. The, the next book's called uh, Tentatively Cyborg Buddha, and it's going to be about moral enhancement and, and those topics, happiness from a transhumanist point of view and things like that. Um, but in the original book, uh, Citizen Cyborg, the, one of the goals of Citizen Cyborg was to reconnect with an older tradition of uh, futurist and utopian left thought that I began to realize that I was uh, the inheritor of and or uh, the reincarnation of or something like that. Um, and that a lot of progressives had lost touch with that uh, a techno utopian aspect of, uh, of left thought that had emerged out of the Enlightenment, or perhaps goes back even further than that. And one aspect of this um, has been the elimination of work, uh, the, the vision that we might be able to eliminate work, that it would be a good thing to eliminate work, uh, which has been a, a, a minority and subordinate opinion within progressive thought for a lot of the time. Um, and because it, it is. Uh, pretty utopian uh, imagination. But it keeps bubbling up, and I just, uh, one example is that in uh, March 2000, uh, in March uh, 22nd of 1964, the Ad Hoc Committee on the Triple Revolution, it was called, the Triple Revolution, sent a long letter to President Lyndon Johnson, a letter was signed by 34 left-wing intellectuals and activists such as Nobel laureate Linus Pauling, the economist Robert Heilbrunner. <coughs> the letter predicted First, a revolution in armaments, armaments which would require new international arrangements to avoid apocalypse. They were right about that. Second was the global human rights revolution, which would require a recommitment to democratizing every country. Of course, they are right about that, but you know, still ongoing. And the third was the cyber nation, or the automation of the economy, which would lead to widespread unemployment and require replacing the welfare state with a universal basic income guarantee which was a debate that was being had in the 1960s, the Humphrey Hawkins bill and other folks, and even Milton Friedman was proposing a version of this, a negative income tax in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and uh, it, you know, today, when we talk about the fiscal cliff, uh, when, we, when we debate with what kinds of austerity we're going to engage in, whether it's going to be little austerity or big austerity um, in Europe and the United States, not so much in the rest of the world because they haven't suffered in quite the same way that we in northern industrialized countries have. Um, I think it's really important to begin to think again about what we think as futurists the next stages of technological evolution are going to be because we're asking entirely the wrong questions in this current debate. Now, I start with this 1964 letter because they were warning President Johnson that the changes in the 1960s were going to start laying off massive, and there was, you know, no jobs were going to be created, and there was going to be a decline. They were wrong, obviously, right? So every time this idea has been proposed since the, uh, since, you know, Condorcet proposed it in the late uh, 18th century, and <clears throat> they were proposing it then, looking around at the uh, implementation of new uh, technologies in agriculture, and thinking, well, if you get rid of these jobs in agriculture, what are people going to do? I mean, <laughs> there couldn't possibly be any jobs after that. They were wrong about that, right? But we, 
from our current point of view, um, have to ask the question, what could human beings do to compete with machines? Because when we look around at uh, you know, ATM machines replacing bank tellers, when we look around at um, the disintermediation of the economy that you, don't, you no longer have to go to uh, a travel agent in order to book your tickets, you can actually do that directly now. These kinds of changes that are the result of information and communication technologies, automation and robotics, we have to ask ourselves, well, it was true that you were able to go from agriculture into industry. That was something human labor could be applied in a different way in industry, and they, didn't, they couldn't imagine that. And it was true when industry was destroyed, or not destroyed, but when industry was transformed by robotics and improvements in, in productivity, it was true that people could go into white collar employment, they could go into service industries, they could go into uh, you know, psychotherapy and all kinds of other uh, occupations. But is it true that there is something else for us to move on to after this, right? And if, if the kinds of improvements occur in artificial intelligence and robotics that we imagine are going to occur in the next uh, couple decades, then it may in fact be the case that there's nothing to move on to after these kinds of jobs. Which means that the era of the kind of economy, wage slavery economy or wage-based work economy, that we created just two, three hundred years ago as the dominant form of economy in the world, it may be coming to an end. And economists and politicians on the left and the right have not yet grappled with this. Uh, this, this is an enormous change. This is a change of structural unemployment that you can already see in the statistics of the United States. You look at the uh, statistics of the percentage of the population, that's, of the adult population that's in employed labor, and it starts to decline. It rises steadily from World War II as women enter the workforce, hits a peak in 2000, and it's been declining steadily ever since. Now, they, uh, the crisis of 2008 made it go down a little bit quicker, the level down again, but it continues to decline. And every month, we would have to add 200,000 new jobs in the United States in order to reverse the trends that have been occurring because people keep getting born, the population has been growing. Actually, the good news may be that last uh, month, apparently, we discovered that the fertility rate in the United States had dropped dramatically because immigrants had stopped having as many children, and this seems to be occurring all over the world. But this, is a, this raises another problem of another dimension. One of the other reasons why the proportion of the population in employed labor has been declining is that the populations have been getting older, which has been terrifying the hell out of policymakers for a decade or more because of what we call the old age dependency ratio. So the ratio of retired old folks to workers has been steadily going in, in, the, in, a, in a south direction. It's been going top heavy. And, but what they haven't been confronting, so they have been confronting that, and they've been talking about things like uh, slashing senior benefits, uh, the entitlement debate, as it's called, um, uh, raising the retirement age to try to force more seniors into a labor force that already is not creating enough jobs for the people who are already there. So they've been talking about that, and they've been talking about the old age dependency ratio, but they haven't been talking about the uh, coming welfare dependency ratio as a consequence of structural unemployment because they just can't wrap their mind around that. You, every single policymaker that you hear on national public radio or CNN are talking about, well, you know, we're in a rough patch now, but we'll be getting back to full employment. Just it's right around the corner. You know, it's just coming. We have to say the the president's policies are going to have some effect pretty soon. So th they can't think about it yet. They don't know what to do with it. Now, I want to turn briefly to our community, the uh, techno-utopian community, and some of the systematic biases that it has. And I'm not picking on James. James here, James Miller, nice guy, and he's written a very interesting book about the singularity, but he's an economist, and as a consequence of being an economist, has imbibed deeply the neoliberal uh, doctrines of his economic faith. And uh, he has, uh, he's in deep denial about uh, this matter uh, of the fundamental changes to, uh, to everything as a consequence of what he's talking about in this book, which is the singularity. So what he talks about in here, he says, um, uh, 
There are going to be uh, profound changes, and in fact, uh, it may result in the elimination of the human race. But if we um, respect property, yeah, it, he says he has a flow chart. He says if AIs are created in this particular way, and they respect property rights, and they allow us to keep 5% of all the wealth that's created, human beings will survive. All the other arrows go to human race eliminated, human race eliminated, human race eliminated. Okay, so that, that's the kind of. You know, that, that's, a, that's a kind of apocalyptic uh, worldview that, that he starts with and that a lot of folks in the singularity community have. So the, the exoteric doctrine in this community, the, the doctrine, when you, when you get past denial, because denial is the first stage. Denial says there is no problem. Uh, you know, in the past people have been uh, uh, Luddite about this stuff. You can't be possibly Luddite about this because the Luddites were wrong. More jobs were created after the looms eliminated the jobs for the weavers. Okay, but aren't you the person who's arguing that these these robots are going to fundamentally change society in such a profound way that it's like a black hole? In fact, you call it a singularity because you think nothing can be the same after this particular point in history. It's going to be a profound change in human history. So capitalism survives, apparently. <laughs> Okay, so the, the exoteric doctrine, when you get past denial with these folks, the exoteric doctrine is, well, we're going to give everybody magic nanoboxes, right? Everybody's going to have magic nanoboxes, and they'll be able to get whatever they want, and no one will be upset that some people have an incredible amount of wealth and other people just have magic nanoboxes to entertain them. Uh, there will be no need for politics required to have this done. Now, I, I have a, a little problem here. Look at what's happened to the movie and music industry, okay? People decided that a computer was a magic nanobox that you could share for free uh, movies and music. And now we have an international regime that's suing the pants off of anybody that they can get a hold of who ha actually does that. That's a fraction of the economy so far, right? Who cares in the end about the, well, some people care, but you know, 50% of us, of the people in the current economy, are involved in the making transportation and sale of actual stuff. Right? So if we actually start to have magic nanoboxes, desktop manufacturing, the disintermediation of the economy in the first place is going to mean the loss of a lot of jobs. A lot of people who make stuff, if there's just patterns out there, you, you download a pattern, you make stuff on your desk, instead of having to go to Walmart or go to uh, you know, Best Buy or someplace, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. But uh, there are going to be people who are responsible for the making of those patterns and for the sale of those machines, and they're going to have exactly the same financial interests in securing their property rights in relationship to those machines. Or we might even get those machines. I mean, if we can't figure out a model for how to get those machines in people's hands, then you know, the, the magic nanobox answer is, of course, well, magic nanoboxes make the magic nan nanoboxes, so you don't have to worry about that. Well, okay, okay, I understand the logic there. You know, magic nanoboxes just self-replicating all over the place. But you know, it, it really, in reality, there are going to have to be supplies of goo that go into these boxes. The boxes have to be repaired. The patterns have to be, uh, their intellectual property has to be respected and paid for somehow. So these, these things just don't happen by magic. Okay. Okay, so the, that's the exoteric doctrine, magic nanobox doctrine. The esoteric doctrine, the internal doctrine, is that we're going to create garbage scows out in the Pacific. And the people who are really clued in, the people who have the wealth and the means and the vision, are going to move onto these garbage scows and build uh, and cognitively enhance themselves and have nano weapons to protect themselves from the pirates, uh, the Somali pirates who want to come after them, and eventually migrate into space and screw the rest of those Ayn Randian, uh, uh, non-Ayn Ayn Randian, but the kind of Ayn Randian vision here, the Atlas Shrugged vision that they have in their head, they're going to just resign from society and the rest of society is going to sink into the mud. Okay, now back to James Miller. Let me just read. <laughs> okay, One, page 173, or 172 here, James Miller. Uh, James Miller says here, if the affluent make wide-scale use of intelligence-enhancing genetics for their children, Americans across the political spectrum would almost certainly support governments making the services available to the poor. <laughs> Conservatives who worry about the social pathologies of the underclass, many of which are correlated with low IQ, and dislike having governments spend money on welfare, would support the poor receiving access to genetic enhancement technologies for their children. 
Apparently, James has no idea about the debates over the provision of medical and social and psychological services to poor people in the United States over the last hundred years, right? We have not had a frictionless political debate uh, where conservatives just saw the inherent logic of providing health and mental health and uh, good education and other kinds of services for the poor. They said, oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, you mean you want to tax me in order to pay for good social services for the poor? Well, then forget it. You know, I don't really care about that anymore. Okay, so that's the first problem. It's not frictionless. Frederick Douglass said, you want progress, you got to have a struggle, okay? Uh, well, let's see, I just lost. I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, page 149. Another quote here. Um, okay, 149. Okay, disregarding the property rights. So here he's talking about um, Robin Hanson's idea. Well, if there are different kinds of singularity he thought, talks about. He says uh, you could have the intelligence explosion, that's uh, Ellie's idea that the, the robots bootstrap themselves into godhood. You could have Kurzweil's idea, which is that we all merge with super AIs and somehow human beings stay in control of this. Um, you can have Robin Hanson's idea that we create emulations of human brains in computers and then they start copying themselves. And the ones with really good work skills work for zero pen cents a, a, on the dollar and uh, the rest of us can't compete as biohumans. So he says here, disregarding the property rights of biohumans would create a dangerous wealth-destroying precedent. So what he's arguing is that the uploaded humans would not want to take our stuff, would not want to see us be destroyed, because uh, capitalism will be so valuable to them uh, that they wouldn't want to just uh, destroy the basis for capitalism, which is property rights. Stable property rights are a vital foundation of capitalism. Without them, rich nations such as the United States would be much poorer than they are today. Assuming that capitalism survives in a Malthusian emulation society. Okay, again, a society in which copies of human beings live in the matrix, copying themselves ad nauseum and doing all the work. This is the society that he imagines. If, assuming that capitalism survives in that, then, uh, Etc. Etc. So, if the, the emulations could credibly commit to a taking all the wealth of the biohumans, but then b never again taking anyone else's property, then they could confiscate our stuff without creating a negative economic precedent. Okay. So here. <laughs> okay. Uh, now the other argument that he makes, he calls it the Ricardian argument, which is that there's a comparative trading advantage between any two parties, to which uh, Anders uh, Sandberg who's a libertarian, I would point out. Andrew Sonberg said, yes, but there's no Ricardian advantage between us trading with ants. Right? I mean, the, the kind of society that they imagine is one in which our relationship to these super AIs is the relationship of ants to human beings, right? So there is no Ricardian. There are, in fact, economic situations in which one party has nothing to offer the other party. And that's the kind of society in which they blithely say, oh, well, that particular line does go to the elimination of the human race. Okay, now, there will be and there will always be calls for Luddite bans in order to maintain employment. And sometimes those Luddite bans will work. I don't want to argue for those bans. What I want us to do instead is to wrap our mind around what it requires to actually promote a vision of a human future in which we all survive and we don't starve and we have relative equality and we have all the benefits of the cool technology that we're creating. And part of that is to promote the goal of a basic income guarantee. That just as we have created uh, other kinds of basic political agreements about what we owe one another as human beings, then we will extend that to say we don't uh, have to necessarily work in order to live. Okay. Now this is precisely, in, the, in this country in particular, the opposite of the direction that the political debate has gone. We were th almost there in the 60s and 1970s. And then Reagan happened, and then the New Right happened, and then the Tea Party happened. And it's almost impossible to imagine a debate today about having a basic income guarantee. But it is the debate that we need to start to have. It is a debate that whose time has come. Okay. Now the, the reason that I started to think about this a long time ago was that this guy, Andre Gortz, a French socialist activist, wrote this book in 1983. He wrote a book uh, shortly before this called uh, Farewell to the Proletariat. 
which was an anticipation of some of the trends in automation and some of the trends in the elimination of work. But this was his political strategy. He said, what, what would it mean to have a political strategy? To, to put forward a vision of what a society would look like to systematically and strategically eliminate necessary labor until we could get to the point where people worked only a couple thousand hours, uh, a, a thousand hours a, 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 a year, or a couple tens of thousands of hours over the course of their life. He talks about things in here like um, creating community workshops, so you know, kind of like publicly funded Home Depots where people could be taught how to make things for themselves to, to provide meaning in their lives. Um, uh, he talks about the, the, the virtue of the standardization and de-skilling of labor. He says if we want a society in which people who have a lot of skills, see this is one of the, the anxieties on the left for a long time, is that uh, computerization and other trends in capitalism take the skill out of certain kinds of jobs. So doctors now were creating expert systems in medicine that will de-skill the work of, do of being a doctor. But doctors are one of the most undemocratic, ancient, aristocratic occupations in our society, which we have worshipped with, you know, with great deference for thousands of years. So the fact that we might, in fact, uh, create a rational way to do doctoring without doctors is a huge democratic step forward, and that we all might then be able to participate in uh, that kind of labor, you know, step into doing a little nursing and step back out of it without really uh, having to go to medical school for eight or ten years. He says that's a huge step forward. That kind of de-skilling is a huge democratization for us. So this is exactly the kind of political strategy that we need to be thinking about. I just want to say, you know, I, I'm not against the speculation. I just, there's in sociology and, and, and humanities and postmodernism, they talk about the illusions. What's missing? What's missing when we talk about the fact that society is going to profoundly change? You know, I, I heard recently that one of the directors of the Singularity Institute talk about this, and he was asked the question so you're saying that people are going to, uh, that all necessary labor is going to be eliminated, and then there's going to be nanoboxes. Is there going to be any gap between the nanoboxes and the elimination of all human labor? He said, well, maybe. 10, 15 years? <laughs> well, a lot could happen in 10, 15 years, you know? A lot of riots, a lot of starvation, a lot of social dislocation. So the illusion is how do we get from the elimination of all social labor to a really humane future? And that's what I want us to think about. Thanks. Okay, all right, we have one one question, time for one question, okay. Um, it's interesting, I'm putting together from, from your uh, description. In Miller's book, what I found, the thrust of it was, intelligence is more important than anything else, far not. Your IQ is where it's at, um, and women aren't necessarily important. <laughs> That's what I got from reading this book. Okay, now let's take that and talk about the second book which fits very nicely into this DIY culture, especially the, the current yeah. thrust towards quantified self, as I was saying a moment ago. That it's really interesting to see if you give people an opportunity to have self-responsibility in an interesting new way, and since we're a gadget culture, we like it, people will take it, and it's this type of um, phenomena that occurred, like a paradigm shift in our ability to take responsibility away from, as you say, the doctor playing the godhead, to where we actually have a participation as a participatory uh, society and culture. And it's an interesting way that happened, but it's such a difference between that particular book and the thrust of it, and as you interpret it, and as it can be seen, to this other book, which is more contemporary, and dealing with this concept that places intelligence and IQ far above empathy, uh, uh, aesthetics, um, compassion, anything else, uh, sensorial mix, intuition, anything else. And I find that the downfall of particular mindset, as the examples you said in the Singularity Institute, whereas we have the Singularity University on the other hand, which is almost the opposite of that, looking for entrepreneurs, looking for ways to create, looking for ways to uh, problem solve, and taking that on. So it's more in the second book that can be seen through the, the lens of the Singularity with the Singularity University as another different example. So I enjoyed the way that you, you packaged that nicely and in my interpretation of it. Well, one of the reasons why 
progressives, a lot of people, have been worried about um, welfare dependency, uh, about uh, the elimination of work for certain populations, is that they believe that work is ennobling. And you look back at the history of the human race, I mean, we were talking about slow, the vision of a slow history. I mean, we need a slow vision of human evolution because this notion that work is ennobling, waged work is ennobling, is such a recent notion, right? It used to be that we lived in integrated communities with other people and we did stuff. We did stuff to feed ourselves, we did stuff because we enjoyed it, we did stuff because our, our parents had taught us how to do stuff, uh, because it was fun. But we didn't do it because we were paid to do it. We didn't do it because it was a career, we didn't do it because it was the meaningless eight hours of things that we had to do each day in order to get something else, to get the booze that we wanted to drink. And eat. You know, the, the, the way that we approach work is so alienating. <laughs> and, you know, not to sound too much like a Marxist, but, uh, uh, but the, the, the way that wage work has, has turned out has been so alienating. And what you're saying is, I think there is a connection between DIY cultures. That it's the attempt to reclaim a sense of personal efficacy. Yes. And, and this is exactly what Gortz was talking about. He's saying, you know, we need to, uh, to reclaim a human meaning in labor. And once we do that, then basic income make, makes a heck of a lot more sense because it'll be, instead of being like welfare queens don't, not knowing what to do with themselves except watch TV or whatever the imagination says about them, um, it'll be more like the aristocrat saying, okay, of noblesse oblige, what do I have to make of my life? You know, what's the meaning that I have to impart to my life because all the other stuff is taken care of? Yeah, the, the, very shortly, the way I put it is that work rather than being a duty becomes a privilege that you aspire to have in order to contribute to your own meaning in life and to society at large. But in the meantime, the right to life becomes part of what, what, what you get from society back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, put your hands together for James. Now we do have a paddle, so we don't really need a table.